about John Lear. Before I get to John, and we have in uh, radio the luxury of a lot of time, John is uh, on the line and able to hear what I'm saying right now. And I guess I'm going to begin this show uh, with my experience, so it's out of the way. And I'm going to relate this experience to you because it really, in some ways, accounts for why John is here on this particular morning. Because when I saw what I saw this last Sunday, I picked up the phone uh, the moment I hit the house and called John Lear's house. Unfortunately, at that point, got a tape and uh, related briefly my experience. And uh, John called me the next day, and uh, we, I, I, it was like a, a confession or something. <laughs> I had to get hold of John. So here's what happened briefly this last Sunday. And I will neither, uh, if I'm able, add, add to it or detract from it. I'm going to tell you the story just as it happened. On my way home to a little town to the west of Las Vegas, about 60 miles to the west, uh, called Pahrump, Nevada. And I was about a mile from home and uh, on a street that runs from east or uh, east-west, and I was traveling east to west uh, to intersect with a street that runs north-south and would take me on the final leg home. It was uh, about uh, 11, it was between 11 and 11.30. I'm sorry, I didn't really note the time that carefully, but somewhere in that uh, window between 11 and 11.30, I should suspect about 11.15 or 20 would be my best guess. And I was on this uh, final street, and all of a sudden, uh, you'll recall, the, the moon was a bit fuller than it is now, so it was fairly well lit up. The uh, weather conditions were calm. Uh, if there was a breeze, it was a very, very light breeze, uh, as to be insignificant. My wife uh, caught something, I guess, out of the corner of her eye and turned around, looked out the back window and said, What in the hell is that? I said, I don't know. And I stopped the car. And uh, I turned off uh, uh, the headlights and uh, uh, rolled down my window. And coming up from behind us, just off the driver's side, was something large. I would guesstimate it would be a hundred feet across. Absolutely triangular. And I would guess it to be at about 150 feet uh, in altitude. And it was coming up literally behind us. Its uh, direction of travel was roughly uh, east-southeast and traveling towards the uh, west-northwest. And it was lit. There were two white lights and one strobing red light. Strobing at a rate uh, faster than you would associate with uh, normal uh, aviation traffic. The object was moving very slowly. The word I would use to describe its movement was more floating. Uh, certainly it was going um, at, a, at a rate that would not sustain conventional aircraft in flight. There just wouldn't be enough lift at that speed. So it was floating and it literally floated uh, right across the, or very nearly across the top of my car, just a little off to the driver's side. And I'll tell you, the sky was lit well enough that when I looked up at it, I was able to discern the substance of it. And it was black and solid and triangular. And it moved uh, out and uh, across uh, uh, my area very slowly floated out across and continued to float in a west-northwesterly direction until uh, I could see it uh, literally going across uh, the entire valley and uh, I was able to keep sight of it uh, for, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe as much as four, four, three or four minutes somewhere in there and then I finally lost sight of it. So I have absolutely no idea what I saw except that it was large, it was precisely as I described to you. It wasn't a guess, it was not an indistinct light. This was without question a craft. The question is, was it a craft that uh, our military has, that we don't know that they have, or was it from someplace else? I don't know. 
I would suspect the first before the second, but certainly either one is possible. So that was my experience. I'm 48 years old. I've never seen one of these things before. I didn't think I ever would see one, but I did. My wife uh, was witness as well. I actually put her on the air uh, the other morning for about 30 seconds just because I didn't want to be out there twisting slowly in the breeze by myself. And I'm still thinking about all this. So there it is. For what it is, for what it's worth, that's my story, and I swear to you, it is true. John Lear. John Lear is an airline captain. John has flown 160 different types of aircraft in over 50 different countries in all types of flying. Experimental test flying, production test flying, airline passenger flying, cargo hauling, movie work, stunt flying, aircraft ferrying, air dropping missions, racing, and secret missions of all kinds. Lear held 18 world speed records in the Learjet, including speed around the world, and holds the most FAA airman certificates issued to a single individual, which include the airline transport rating, flight instructor, ground instructor, navigator, flight engineer, flight dispatcher, airframe, and power plant mechanic, control tower operator, and parachute rigger. He's been a commercial pilot for 30 years and has been flying for 35 he holds the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Award for Outstanding Airmanship, presented in 1968. He's flown missions worldwide for various government agencies, flew in Southeast Asia between 1967 and 73, and has flown extensively in Europe, the Middle East, Afghanistan, the Far East, and Africa. As a non-sked pilot, he has over 16,000 hours of flight time, of which over 12,000 hours are in jets. Lear's father, of course, was William P. Lear Sr., who not only helped develop the first car radio, the A-Track uh, stereo, the automatic pilot for fighter aircraft, but who developed the Lear jet, one of the first and most successful of all business jet aircraft. Lear studied industrial design at the Art Center College in Los Angeles, and was a state senate candidate in Nevada, 1980. He's written extensively about airplanes and other subjects and was Middle East correspondent for Combat Illustrated between 1975 and 1977 while stationed in Beirut. He is an amateur photographer and astronomer and has won several photography awards for pictures taken during his worldwide travels. In the early 70s, Lear owned and skippered the 12-meter America's Cup boat soliloquy out of Marina del Rey. Lear's interest in UFOs began after reading Bud Hopkins' book, Missing Time, and then a chance encounter with U.S. Air Force pilot who was at a base in England where an extraterrestrial craft landed in December of 1980. Ladies and gentlemen, John Lear. Good morning, John. All right, how you doing? Good to have you back. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know where to start, John, except I'm sure you were listening and heard what I had to say. That is exactly as my experience occurred. I never thought I'd uh, have one, John. No. And it's still... Uh, it's, it's, I've been very thoughtful about it ever since. The audience has helped because they kept talking about it. But uh, it's just preying on my mind. Any idea what I saw? Well, uh, if I had to guess, uh, based on all the stories I've heard, I would say that it's uh, uh, a, an A-12 Avenger. Okay, one other fact, John, that I did leave out, and that was that uh, it was very still. I've said on the air you could hear a cricket a quarter mile away, and that was the case. It was very quiet, and as close as this doggone thing was to me, uh, John, it did not make a sound. No. Not a sound. I mean, what what kind of A-12 Avenger, what is that? You have some uh, very, very quiet airplanes. And like I say, I'm not saying what it was, just what I think it was. Uh, the A-12 Avenger is the airplane that was canceled. Uh, it was the Navy uh, uh, fighter bomber that was canceled, oh, about a year ago. 
uh, by the Pentagon because of cost overruns. It was uh, being built by uh, General Dynamics and McDonnell Douglas. And what happened is when uh, the funds were withdrawn for this thing, unbeknownst to the public and everybody else, there was about 10 to, to 13 of this craft already in various stages of construction, hmm. uh, most of them already built. So when they withdrew the funds uh, to this uh, craft, they uh, asked Lockheed to uh, get it in the air, and they took these, uh, it was about 10 to 13 airplanes, and uh, uh, worked on them. What they had to do is, these were Navy airplanes uh, ostensibly for a carrier, and they had to, one of the over, uh, overweight mechanisms was the wing folding mechanism, and uh, <clears throat> there's some other things in it, and uh, put engines in them and started flying it. And they're extremely, extremely quiet. Um, and they're the ones that are flying around. Now, one of the reasons why I say this is, is because if it had been anything strange, like something extraterrestrial, uh, it's possible that it would have uh, uh, canceled your or put out your headlights or your engine or something like that, uh, which is usually the way. Also, there wouldn't have been the white light uh, on it, possibly the red light, but I don't know if anybody has seen uh, a saucer with a uh, flashing red light, no matter what. Okay, one, other, one other aspect it had, John, was it was flying too slow to be sustained in flight uh, aerodynamically, as I understand it, uh, I mean, it was John. It was floating. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's the one thing because uh, the uh, conventional craft do need lift, and uh, although the the uh, Delta plan form does create quite a bit of lift, uh, it does need a little bit of speed. So uh, I, you know, since I wasn't there and I don't know, sure, uh, you sure. know, I didn't see it. I'm not sure what it was, but it sure sounds like these uh, A-12 Avengers. You know, one of the things they do, and I say they, is is uh, we, the public, don't get to know all those secrets. So uh, one of the things they do is they play little tricks on us. They they find out what, what we're doing, what the important people are doing, what Art Bell is doing on Sunday night, and, <laughs> and fly out and, and intercept him and fly over him and and uh, get him to say that he saw an extraterrestrial craft. And then, oh, oh, no, but Art Bell's not said that. And then when they're in the briefing room, they say, hey, man, guess what? Art Bell said he saw, he yeah. saw me uh, flying. I guess I'm an alien, huh? And, yeah. and that's their little joke that they play on, on the public. So I'm not saying that happened, but that's the little things that they like to do. John, my guess would have to be, I said it uh, earlier in the week, if somebody pressed me against the wall and said, we want your best guess and out with it now or we're punching you, I'd have had to say I thought that it might be some sort of military secret aircraft. Uh, that is my first guess. And there was nothing about it that would suggest, uh, except that it's like it performed as nothing, John, I've, I've ever seen or that I've understood on Earth could fly in the air too slow, too quiet, too close. It was so close. That was the thing about it, John. I could see all the substance of it, not details. No windows, no markings, nothing like that. But I saw the black craft come over. You know, it was dark black, and the sky was lighter because it was near a full moon. Oh. Uh, well, that's one thing that doesn't make uh, sense, is they don't like to fly those things on uh, any night when there's a, 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 any kind of a moon, because it does let people see what they are. Uh, also, uh, the engines that we have, that even though our technology base is about 30 years ahead of uh, where the public thinks it is, uh, we're kind of strapped to... Uh, uh, turbine and, and fan jet engines, and they do make some sound. So being at that low uh, and that close, it would seem that they would make a noise. But it's still, just, I'm going to have to stick with uh, uh, that, it, that it's a craft of ours. There's a lot of things they, they have. There's probably five or six airplanes that they have that the public doesn't know anything about. For instance, the F-19, uh, which was built right along on the same assembly line as the F-117A, has been flying around for almost uh, 12 years now. Uh, it's a Navy uh, fighter uh, with a Delta Wing plan form, a uh, very, very strange-looking aircraft, and the public doesn't know anything about that. Frankly, John, I had not heard that many reports of triangular UFOs. I thought mine was unique, and I came on the air and reported it, and all of a sudden people started sending me newspaper articles and reports of triangular objects sighted up in the state of Washington, and on and on and on. My fax machine lit up. And uh, so apparently there have been, and, and so did my telephone, so there have been quite a few sightings of that sort. Uh, and you would attribute most of them, do you think, John, to 
experimental U.S. aircraft? No, some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Are there any uh, substantial reports that you know of, John, uh, of alien craft or, or craft that appeared to be alien uh, that were triangular? No, not that I've heard. They're mostly uh, the flying wing type, huge flying wings, or circular craft. But I haven't heard too much of the uh, the triangular type being what we uh, uh, what we think of as extraterrestrial. All right, there was a uh, program on Fox last night that I fortunately know that you saw because I called you. And uh, as a matter of fact, my boss called me and said, "Hey, it's on." I switched over and I caught it. And the whole cast of characters was there. Linda Howe, she's on my Sunday Area 2000 show. George Knapp, same deal. Stent Friedman, I noticed. Uh, Bob Lazar. Uh, there was a picture there of S12 that was attributed to you. Um, uh, so the whole cast of characters, Bud Hopkins, and on and on and on, all of them were on. It was an excellent show. What did you think of it? I thought it was uh, very interesting. It's about two or three years old. And I remember when Sightings did that program. It was one of their first ones. Uh, they did do the interview with uh, Bob Lazar, which was uh, very interesting. And, of course, George Knapp and Linda Howe were on there. And I, you know, George, when I first went on George Knapp's uh, program on the record in 1987, you know, he, I clearly remember him uh, very, very skeptical. You know, geez, John, you know, it's kind of hard to believe, you know, extraterrestrial craft at the test site. And yeah. after a couple of years, he went, you know, got pretty involved in the research and then did those very, uh, very well done uh, uh, best evidence programs show. that he did the uh, UFO best, best evidence. evidence and and now he's out on the road he does almost every uh, UFO uh, lecture on the on the uh, on the lecture beat that uh, that there is right and uh, he doesn't it seems as though he remembers you know himself uh, initiating the investigation investigation into UFOs but he doesn't remember that uh, you know that I was on his program and I you know originally started not that I care one way or the other but it would be nice for him to say once in a while you know uh, John Lear was the one that uh, to, that uh, originally piqued my interest and did the initial investigation on that. Oh John I would say you are the great granddaddy of researchers in the UFO field. Well, there was a lot of people before me, but uh, as far as George Nance is concerned, it would be nice for once in a while for him to say, you know, uh, John Lear was the Well, he may, John, you know, what he may feel is, you know, he was a, um, a, a mainline sort of journalist, and he may feel that he was one of the first mainline journalists to really turn his head to this whole affair, and that may be fair to say. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the other thing that I found significant that he said was that he investigated uh, the mob, you know, here in Las Vegas for years and years and years. And um, the um, the fear associated with investigating the mob, according to him, was almost nothing compared to the fear generated by uh, the investigation of uh, this UFO phenomenon. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably true. You, you concur with that, huh? Uh, yes. I never investigated the mob, but... Uh... I knew uh, Ned Day very well, and he's the one that uh, that gave George most of his contacts. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure that would be so. Um, but nevertheless, that's quite a statement to make, that the fear associated with this ultimately is uh, even bigger than the fear associated with investigating the mob. John, uh, we're going to take a break here at the bottom of the hour, and uh, we'll come back and get into all of this uh, a little a little deeper. Stay right where you are. Great. Okay. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM from Las Vegas. My guest is John Lear. Subject: UFOs. More in a moment. disturbs you, by all means, take a hike, turn your radio off, and come back another day. And this does disturb uh, and upset some people. It's a very sensitive topic. It's about UFOs, unidentified flying objects, or as some people call them, uh, identified flying objects, and I think John is one of those. Um... I just had an interesting call. John, um, I just had a call off the air from a source that I trust who said, Art, um, Area 22, and I don't have any idea what that is, and the old uh, Area uh, S4 or the area up uh, uh, right up around S4 or above S4 is now occupied by the Navy. 
Well, it was always occupied by the Navy. As a matter of fact, that's where uh, Lazar's checks came from, was Department of Naval Intelligence. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Navy has always been ahead of uh, all of these projects. They've just used the U.S. Air Force as the whipping boy. Uh, when the Air Force recovered the, uh, the saucers, the first ones in 1947, uh, in fact, um, uh, Admiral Hillencotter uh, was appointed head of MJ-12, and the Navy took control of the whole program and always have been in charge of this program. Uh, they were head of uh, both what is, is known old as, as Area 51, referred to as the Box, and S-4, which is, just, is near Papoose Lake, uh, in charge of that. All right, John, we have um, many new affiliate uh, radio stations here on the network since you've uh, last been on. So a lot of people really don't know a whole lot about you one way or the other. I read your bio at the beginning, but uh, they don't know a whole lot about you, and there is quite a story. Um, so briefly, John, um, I I'll tell you, as I saw this thing. When I saw this thing last Sunday, I had a full day to think about whether I really wanted to come on the air and talk about it or not. And I went back and forth uh, arguing with myself uh, during that period, trying to decide whether I would publicly admit this. And um, I, I'm still not fully certain I did the right thing because I've taken some heat uh, because of it, John. Uh, so then this is what I'm relating to your decision working for a, a commercial airline company, coming out publicly with all of this UFO business. You might give my audience a little history about what happened when you did that. Well, I got interested in um, uh, UFOs, so to speak. Uh, I, I kind of had a little bit of interest because my dad was um, uh, used to talk about it quite a bit. Uh, but I wasn't all that interested until 1985 when... Uh, I ran into a friend who uh, I knew in Laos. I, I flew over uh, in Southeast Asia for about uh, six or seven years. Uh, this guy was one of the guys that flew in, in one of the covert programs uh, over there called the Steve Canyon Program. He was a raven, for those of you who know what, uh, who ravens were. Uh, anyway, many years later, he came to the Air Force Base transferring into the uh, uh, the guard, the Air Force guard, mm -hmm. and he came and called, gave me a call, came up to the house, and we were talking about one thing and another, and I asked him where all he'd been based, and one of the places he mentioned was Bentwaters, and Bentwaters is a United States Air Force base uh, in England, about 70 miles northwest of London, and most pilots uh, have heard about a saucer, saucer that supposedly landed in December of 1980. And when he said Ben Waters, I said, oh, that's supposedly where that uh, saucer landed. And he said, no, John, that's supposedly it did. He said, I didn't see it because I was confined to quarters, but I talked to the guys who did. And if you ever run into them, uh, you know, just ask them about it. And he gave me their names. One was General Gordon Williams. One was uh, Major uh, Ted Conrad. Another was uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Chuck Halt. And although I didn't run into those guys, I ran into other people who were uh, who had been there and had seen the saucer and the three aliens get, get out and uh, walk up to General Gordon Williams. Well, anyway, this set me on a uh, 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 investigation. I thought I knew a lot about uh, secret and covert programs, and it's been you know one of my big interests uh, is figuring out what's really going on. And uh, so I, you know. Uh, Checked around for about uh, two years, writing letters and uh, talking to people, and came up with the uh, the astounding uh, uh, revelation that yes, uh, it was true there were UFOs uh, that our government was uh, dealing with uh, extraterrestrials, unbeknownst to uh, uh, almost 100 percent of the public, uh, and that it was real and going on. And uh, for my efforts. Uh, there were several uh, uh, very nasty articles that were printed about me. Uh, I was called into the company that I worked for then. I was a senior captain with a major charter company uh, uh, located in the Midwest. And they called me in one day and they said, uh, hey, is it is it true that you believe in flying saucers? I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. And they said, why? And I gave them briefly what I just told you. And they said, well, we can't have any captains that, uh, <laughs> that believe in that flying for us. You're fired, and they took my ID, and I was out the door in 20 minutes from a company that I'd worked for for 10 years. So that certainly cost me dearly. Uh, I, I might say that I've, I've flown some fun airplanes and had some fun after that, so it wasn't a total loss. Uh, I went on to fly the DC-8 
uh, for some different companies and uh, really enjoyed myself, but uh, uh, that was basically what happened. John, there have been a couple times during your um, long uh, in investigative uh, years when I know that you've sort of shut down. Uh, for a time, you did no interviews at all, uh, and I, I think they, perhaps you did one during that period with me. Other than that, you shut down completely. And uh, I wonder if that was a result of this kind of pressure or you just uh, felt you had gone as far as you could go or got discouraged over the whole thing or what led to that sort of shutdown for a while? Well, what leads to that shutdown is it's so overwhelming, the truth of it all, the, uh, the hugeness of it, uh, the reality of it, when it hits you that it's all so real, uh, sometimes you can't handle it. Like there have been several people that I've talked to at the test site that have worked up there, and there's very, very few of them that are, that are in uh, to the extent where they know about the, uh, uh, the government's dealing with the extraterrestrials. They'll quit the program and they'll say, I don't want anything more to do with it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to see, about it, see anything. I want to retire and live out my life in peace. It just becomes so overwhelming what's going on. And that's essentially what happened to me. And yet you've come back. Yeah, I come back because I get phone, you know, you're out of it for two or three months or three or four months, and then you kind of wonder what's going on. You make a call, and you hear about some uh, neat new uh, thing that's going on. And, and it pulls you right back into it. Yeah, yeah. Back into the deal, you know. All right. Uh, I want to deal briefly with the cover-up aspect of it. Everybody thinks there is a cover-up. Uh, if indeed all this is going on, there has to be a cover-up. Timothy Good wrote Above Top Secret. The implication of it, and they covered it on the UFO report on Fox last night, uh, a couple of presidents, uh, people in high places have tried to get this out, but even presidents, according to this report last night, have been denied, and actually requests denied. Uh, whoever knows about all this is keeping it very, very close indeed if a, if a president of the United States can't pry it loose. Well, first of all, the president of the United States does not have a very high security clearance. He's an elected official, uh, and the people who run this have a tremendous disdain for both elected and appointed officials. Those people aren't in office long enough, first of all, to be vetted to, to get a security clearance, uh, and they not, and most of them are not, uh, in, uh, so they don't get it. So, uh, one of the, uh, misconceptions that people have is they think that top secret is a big clearance. They'll say, well, I know so-and-so, Colonel so-and-so in the Air Force, and he had a top secret clearance, and he didn't know anything about UFOs. Well, I'll tell you something about clearances. Top secret is the absolute lowest you can get. Above top secret, there are 28 levels of what they call top secret crypto, and they're labeled top secret crypto 1 through 28. And then above that, there's 10 levels of clearances, each one higher than the other, that are names like Umbra and Ultra and Majestic, Majestic being the highest of all clearances. The President of the United States holds around, not exactly, but around Top Secret Crypto 17. Uh, they tell him basically what he needs to know. The President of the United States makes decisions on information that is fed to him by the CIA and NSA, DIA, and various other groups. He doesn't look at raw data that comes in. He gets summaries of information, and those people just feed him the information uh, that they want him to make uh, decisions on, and that's the only information he gets. He really doesn't have a need to know all this stuff, although as far as the extraterrestrials and UFOs, they tell him a little bit. They say, yeah, we have some saucers, and yes, we have uh, some dealings, uh, but that's about it. So basically, that's how it goes. Uh, the President of the United States uh, does not have a need to know to run the day-to-day the -day stuff. He's merely a figurehead uh, as far as uh, running our country. All right, this implies then an ongoing, literally, uh, I guess, uh, I hate to use the phrase because it's such a catchphrase, but a secret government, a government that transcends uh, presidential administrations that come and go and holds some very important information always to itself. About right? Certainly. And that was set up by uh, President Truman in 1947. Uh, it was called the MJ-12. He initially pointed the 12 persons that were part of that secret government. Uh, they were various intelligence, uh, military, and scientific personnel to basically study uh, the recovered saucer and the implications of it. And uh, then when Eisenhower uh, was elected in 1952, he felt that the secret was so important 
that he gave the, uh, uh, the essentially uh, the teeth to MJ-12 to actually make the major decisions uh, of the country based on what they had found out. And Eisenhower essentially regretted uh, what he did in 1960. He made a talk, made a speech in which he said, beware of the military-industrial complex, which he himself had created by giving MJ-12 so much power. Hmm. Uh, for those persons who believe uh, or who don't believe that MJ-12 exists, uh, my source I will release when that person dies. He's one of the top military figures of this country. He is... Uh, well, I, I don't want to push anybody into the grave, John, but are we going to have a long wait, do you suppose? He's quite elderly. Uh, it will not be a long wait. Uh, and when he does pass away, I will tell you my source for the existence of MJ-12, which I believe to be the secret government. Well, that's going to be a big story, and I hope you'll break it here. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. means a lot. <laughs> um, John... There have been remarkable rumors, rumblings, and anger about this Mars mission, the one that just uh, apparently, I say apparently, failed. Uh, here we had a craft, a billion dollar just about craft, uh, with no doubt very high resolution equipment on board, I would think at least uh, equivalent to our KH series of satellites, meaning we would have uh, received incredible detailed uh, photographs uh, of Mars, and just before the orbit insertion burn, they lost contact. It either blew up or it uh, transistor went belly up or whatever their latest story is. I don't know, but I would like your, whether you've, I know you've got your ear close to the ground on this kind of thing. What are you hearing? Oh, it was the same thing as the Hubble telescope failure. Uh, neither event uh, ever occurred. The Hubble telescope uh, was looking at things which were, in effect, none of the public's business, so they just said that it failed. Uh, and that way they could look at things they need to do without the public saying, hey, you know, well, how about showing us we paid for this thing? Uh, let's see it. And uh, NASA doesn't want to show us. So they say, oh, you know, it failed. Oh, we're sending up some astronauts in a few years to fix it, and then we'll be able to, you know, to show you. Uh, same thing with the Mars Observer. They had some problems uh, with the Mars Observer in that it was going to show some very high-resolution uh, pictures of Mars, which we wanted to see, particularly the Cydonia region in which the uh, uh, the, the so-called face on Mars exists, which NASA says is just a trick of, of light and shadows, but in fact it is a huge face over uh, a kilometer long, uh, for some reason carved in the surface of Mars, and according to Richard Hoagland, um, located quite near a city. Uh, it's my understanding from several good sources that yes, in fact, that city does exist. It's not occupied now, but there was uh, obviously uh, an intelligent race on Mars uh, uh, far in advance to us at one time. Uh, but anyway, uh, the bottom line was this Mars observer was going to give us some very good pictures, and Michael Malin was in charge of the of the private kind of company selected by NASA to oversee these pictures and to categorize them and, and all that. Uh, Michael Malin, Malin said in the first six months that he was going to not going to release any pictures, but after that he would release uh, a selected dozen pictures. And then after that, all the pictures would go into computer and would not be available for the public and no to the public and no hard copies would be made. How well, can they dare do that, John, or even suggest they're going to do that when it is taxpayer money that puts it up there? How can they do that? And so Congress started under pressure from uh, several groups and a lot of people started saying, now, wait a minute, we paid for this. We want to see more than a dozen pictures of Mars. And it got to be uh, uh, such a problem for NASA, they effectually, uh, you know, uh, in effect said, well, you know, okay, then uh, uh, BS, you're not going to see anything. Yeah. And they picked a point where they were going to pressurize the fuel tanks uh, for the insertion around Mars and had everything go dead after that. So when people would say, oh, yes. Uh, they pressurize the fuel tanks. Well, it wouldn't take a rocket scientist uh, to figure out that they pressurized the fuel tanks and something happened and it blew up. 
And so basically everybody's forgot about it. Uh, pictures are coming down uh, great, beautiful, uh, high-resolution pictures of Mars, and the public uh, is, is none the wiser. They buy it. They believe in NASA. They believe in their government. They don't believe their government would, would uh, uh, be uh, above this kind of subterfuge. John, there was a day when I was one of those people, and it wasn't very long ago, and uh, I have been disappointed again and again with the FBI, with... Uh, a BATF, and so my cynical quotient, as I like to call it, has risen and risen and risen to the point where I, I just, I, I almost, John, I almost don't believe anything they say anymore. Well, I have a good friend uh, that we all know, I won't mention his name, who's been very skeptical uh, of some of the of my claims, like when the Hubble blew up, uh, this guy said, well, you know, those accidents do happen, and then when we lost the Titan IVs, well, this thing, uh, these things do happen, and we lost another KH-11. Well, you know, there are accidents, and uh, I was uh, back in uh, the uh, East Coast uh, doing something, and I called in, and I said, hey, what's going on? I said, have you listened to CNN? And, and I said, no, why? He said, uh, about the Mars Observer uh, blowing up? I said, oh, yeah, it's just another one of those uh, coincidences. He says, no, it's a conspiracy. And I said, now, wait a minute. Uh, are you actually falling off the fence now? And he says, <laughs> yes, I've fallen off the fence, and I can't get up. Yeah, <laughs> I can't get up. I guess I feel a little bit the same way, John. I really did trust in our government for the most part, uh, not not very long ago, as a matter of fact. And it's been a long series of disappointments. And I, I guess I'm a bit off the fence myself. And a lot of things about the failure of the Mars mission for me don't add up. They uh, they made noise uh, first about the possibility of it blowing up. Then they discounted that. Latest theory is we had a bad batch of transistors. Now, they, they claim this accounted also for the weather satellite, by the way, lost on the same day uh, and, uh, and, and one earlier mission. That doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up, John. If, if they had lost a previous craft because of one of these transistors, they'd have tested the hell out of them, run them up to two or three hundred times the rated value, been very sure. In other words, it was a problem point to look at. And then on top of all that, there's a redundant system. So none of this really quite adds up, John. No, but they got away with the Hubble telescope. They weren't sure whether the public was going to go for that. But when they got away with that, they figured, well, we could probably get away with some more. And uh, basically, uh, anything that's up there that uh, is going to give information, they just say, well, it doesn't work. And essentially, the public buys it because there's nothing they can do about it. Well, yeah, space is not a precise science, and accidents will happen covers a lot of ground. And uh, the way that they do it is most of that information, or all that information, is downlinked to an area near Fresno, and it goes through four or five uh, different stations before it ever gets to JPL or Houston. So your, your claim is they're, they're receiving nice, high-resolution pictures of Mars right this minute. No question about it. Uh, but the people at JPL and, and Houston uh, honestly believe that they're not getting information because they are not part of the subterfuge, and they cannot be part of the subterfuge uh, so that they can give uh, completely uh, honest uh, information as far as they know. The guys that you see on TV, they don't know what's going on, and the reason is is because they have to give totally believable stories to the public. All right, John, hold that thought. We'll be right back with John Lear right after this. This is an encore presentation of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. And now back to the best of Art Bell.